As I mentioned before, the lecturer for tonight is Dr. Timothy Whitmer. Uh, Dr. Whitmer has taught at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia uh, for 20 years, and he's been in pastoral ministry for 38 years. His last week of lectures as a full-time lecturer on the, uh, the Westminster faculty at Westminster was last week at Westminster. But his last week of lectures as a full-time member of the Westminster Seminary faculty is at Christ College. <laughs> we are honoured, sir. So. At Westminster Theological Seminary, Dr. Whitmer has served as professor and coordinator of the Department of Practical Theology. He is ordained as a minister of the gospel in the Presbyterian Church in America, and he's now pastoring and returning to full-time pastoral ministry at St. Stephen's Reformed Church in Pennsylvania. He met his wife, Barbara, who's with us tonight, as they were at high school. And they have three children, and they have seven grandchildren. Uh, Tim's publications, include The Shepherd Leader, a book that's been widely read here in Australia, particularly in elders training. Uh, the Shepherd Leader at Home, and a book called Mindscape, What to Think About Instead of Worrying. Uh, we're particularly excited that this week, uh, Dr. Whitmer has been teaching a course on shepherd leadership. We at Christ College are working very hard on reworking our curriculum in making it even more applied in its theology in not giving up the rigours of academic study, but seeing that we need to bridge the gap to applied theology. And one of the most significant metaphors in scripture that we're seeking to apply is the metaphor of a shepherd. If you want to read any of his books on the way home, you can pop by the Reformers uh, bookshop out there. And there's a few of his books that I'm sure that you can buy. And David Burke would want me to mention that you can also buy Burned or Bush if you haven't got one of those from the assembly. So tonight's lecture is entitled, What to Do Instead of Worrying. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So if you've got some questions, uh, please write them down. But would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Whitmer. Thank you very much. Okay. You're in Australia. I can't call you Dr. Whitmer. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. Perfect. Tim. You can call me Tim. Tim. That's great. Tim, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. First time to Australia? I love Vegemite. Absolutely. <laughs> can I tell you about Tim? This is, this is true. Did you hear that long list of ferry lecturers who've been here over the years? By and large, they all stay at our place. And when we get to know them, by about Wednesday, we say, you've got to try this. And we force the Vegemite down. <laughs> Well, I want to tell you about Tim. Not only did we get there before Wednesday, but this is the truth. You are the only ferry lecturer the next morning to say, where is the veggie? <laughs> Two more <laughs> Uh, apart from Vegemite, though, because we are more than Vegemite, uh, what are your impressions of Australia? You've been here a few days. I have been really impressed with the, the friendliness of the people. Mm -hmm the hospitable nature of, of the folks, because everywhere we've gone, uh, we've been lost most places we've gone. That's true. You have my mobile number. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, had no difficulty at all. Anybody I see, I ask, could you help me? And they see how helpless I look. <laughs> and no, seriously, it's been wonderful to see right. how cordial and loving the people have been. Excellent. Very Excellent. different than Philadelphia. Oh, really? Yes, I'm the, brother, the city of brotherly love. I know, that's what Not so much. Okay. Not so much. Now, you met Barbara at high school. That's correct. And I was just talking to you the other day, and when you met her, you were using a pseudonym, I hear. Right. Your name was Tom and her name was Fiona. That's why correct. Why would you, you went through school together, so why would you new, use a pseudonym to meet your wife? But because we were cast as romantic leads in Brigadoon. Oh, really? <laughs> so I was Tommy Albright and she was Fiona McLaren. Uh -huh. <laughs> and our first kiss was in the high school lobby during play practice with 50 people standing there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been great to have Barb with us tonight. Now, Tim, you've been involved in theological education for 20 years. You've been involved in pastoral ministry for 38 years. And I really love the way that you've said that because it's not as though you did one and then the other. You've done two simultaneously, which is always how it should be. But you're going back to full-time church-based ministry. 
And we here at Christ College are trying to train people for that. What sort of changes have you seen over the years? What do we need to be doing to equip pastors and leaders mm -hmm. for the church in the 21st century from your experience? Uh, I think what you said in your opening video is very, very important. That is that you're trying to engage the practical together with the, uh, the theoretical and the uh, theological education, et cetera, because it's so important for students to learn how to, uh, so many times if an education is just cerebral, then students are going to get out into the world and into ministry and not know what to do, how to handle things. So I'm really, really pleased to see that that's the approach you're taking. We are trying, have been trying to do that at Westminster. One of my responsibilities at the seminary has been the director of the mentored ministry program. So I basically oversaw all the internships of all the students. I wanted to make sure they got that engagement. So I think that's a real key, especially given the, the challenges that we're facing in the world today. And finally, you've written a fair bit about shepherding. I mean, actually, if you think of, if you say, for those who know, if you say the name, Tim Whitmer, what's the first word that comes into your head? It's nearly always shepherd. Cheesesteak. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> you lost me. <laughs> no, cheesesteak. It's a sandwich. No, I, th I think you're right. I think they... <laughs> Cheesesteak is. Oh, yes, there we go. There we go. Yeah. That's four of them. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the metaphor of a, a shepherd yes. is used again and again in scripture. Why is it so a power, such a powerful metaphor? And why, why have you devoted so much of your life to talking about shepherds? Uh, it's a powerful metaphor, not only because it's found uh, throughout the entirety of scripture, because it describes the, the comprehensive care that, first of all, God provides for his people, so that for us to be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is, is the greatest picture of contentment that we can possibly have. And then to think about those of us who are called to be under shepherds, to, have, uh, to understand the responsibility that we have as those who are called to supplement, to care for God's people, as he cares for them, so he's caring for them through us. And I think it's a, a great metaphor because it, it I, you don't want me to go on and on and on, because I could go on and on and on. <laughs> but you'll be going on and on on that on Saturday, and I'll tell you about that later right, on. Right, I will. Tim, it's, it, I won't hold you any longer. It's, uh, people have come here to hear you, and we okay. look forward to hearing you tonight. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. It is great to be here with you this evening. And Ian already told me that he's really happy that more than five people showed up. <clears throat> and I am very grateful that you spent, are uh, spending this evening with us. Uh, I wanted to say another word about Westminster's reputation. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes our seminary has a reputation of being a little too cerebral. And so we were trying to figure out a way to do something practical for the church. So we thought about developing a website called meharmony.com. And the objective would be to match people with the right church. So there would be, for example, several things that could be used, matchability indexes, if you would, to match people with the right church. And here are a couple of them, just to see what you think. There's the worship thermometer. Do you like your worship services exciting and vibrant, warm, or do you prefer a service that is more contemplative, cool? Well, the worship thermometer matches the worship temperature between you and the potential matches, so you don't have to be embarrassed by walking out of a service where things are too warm or too cold again. Our commitment is to match you with a worship service that is just right. <laughs> But then uh, here's the coziness continuum. Have you ever gone to a church and everyone is very friendly? <laughs> very, very friendly? Or perhaps you've visited a church where there's no one talking to you at all, and that's the way you like it. Well, we visited all the churches on the meharmony.com site and have ranked them on the, on the coziness continuum 
They are ranked from swarm all over you <laughs> to as if I wasn't there. <laughs> but here's my favorite, the sermon chronometer. After all, you know how long you would like the sermon to be. You want no more than 15 minutes? Fine. We've analyzed sermons posted on church websites and developed a database, the sermon chronometer, through which you can match your desired sermon length with dozens of preachers in your geographical area. Why sit through another sermon looking at your watch? We've already done that for you. <laughs> After all, it's not always what the preacher says. It's how long he takes to say it. <laughs> So we're thinking that might be something would be to drum up some interest in Westminster Seminary and show people that we are a little uh, more friendly or a little more practical. Of course, that's tongue in cheek. I'm sure you understand that. Um, I want to talk tonight about, about worry. And as you know, I am not a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a mental health care professional. Uh, I'm a shepherd. I'm a student of the Bible and a soul care professional, if you will. And I've walked with people through very anxious times in their lives. And we know that everyone worries. In the United States, it's epidemic. Billions of dollars are spent every year on medications to address it. Stress and worry is linked to leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, stroke. Also, linked to the development of the most major health, mental health problems, depression, PTSD, etc. We worry about little things, worry about big things. We worry about things that pop up suddenly. We worry about things that can go on for days, weeks, months, years, and day I say, dare I say, decades. Australians worry. I looked it up. Now, what do Australians worry about? I wanted to be sure to contextualize my message tonight. Well, the Macquarie University uh, did a study that indicated that Australians worry most about their future careers. Executive director of the Australia Institute, Richard Dennis, says that career anxiety is linked to concerns about job security and the pressure of getting ahead. Other major concerns affecting Australians are their achievements and events of the future such as, will they have a home or will they be able to pay their bills? I found this interesting. Australians are more concerned about personal matters while broader issues such as society, the environment, or politics play a less important role. I think that's just being realistic. And did you know that there are some gender-specific worries? Did you ever think about the fact that women worry about what men forget? And men worry about what women remember? <laughs> but there have been all kinds of answers to this question. Uh, Surrey University did a, a survey of some of the most recent uh, approaches to worry. Here are a couple of them, see how they sound to you. One of them is, set aside a designated worry time. So if you're going to worry, set aside a designated worry time. Instead of worrying all day, every day, designate 30 minutes when you'll do your worrying. This is Penn State research now. They uh, encouraged a multi-step process, which uh, includes identify the object of worry, come up with a time and place to think about said worry, Step three, if you catch yourself worrying at a time other than your designated worry time, you must make a point to think of something else. Use your worry time productively by thinking of solutions to the worries. Well, see, my problem is I worry when I'm going to find time to worry. <laughs> uh, another suggestion is to accept worry and then move on. They most helpfully and scientifically say, Worrying about worrying is a dangerous cycle to fall into. I imagine so. Therefore, people who get caught up in worry when they try to force themselves to stop worrying may want to try a different strategy. They just say, accept that I'm a worrier. But why doesn't that make me feel better? 
Then another one suggests to write down your worries. This is from Science Journal. Write down your worries. It might be counterintuitive, but it's almost as if you empty your fears out of your mind. That wouldn't help me, because now I'm, am I not only thinking about them, now I've got to look at them written down on paper. Well, I think as we consider the subject tonight, we have some better news than that. And as Ian mentioned, uh, the book that I wrote titled Mindscape is really, it's really the first book I wanted to write. In fact, if you look at my computer, there's a file that says book number one. But it wasn't book number one, it was book number three, because I was compelled by circumstances to, to write The uh, Shepherd Leader, and then the natural follow-up to that was A Shepherd Leader at Home. But this was a book I had to write. I had to write it because I'm a worrier. My wife is a worrier. We had just come out of a period of time when I had gone through some major health concerns. And it was also a period of time when, my, when our son was deployed to Iraq at the height of the, the surge just a, a few years ago. And it's amazing how intergenerational worry is. When I was working on this, my 11-year-old granddaughter came up to me and she said, Grandpa, are you writing another book? I said, yes, I am. She said, what's it about? I said, it's called Mindscape. What to think about instead of worrying. And she said, oh, I need that. (laughs) (laughs) That gave me the idea of coming up with maybe a chicken soup for warriors. Mindscape for teens, Mindscape for retirees. Just, just kidding, for sure. But it is, it is a, a, a major problem. And where are we to find help? Uh, the concept for the book called Mindscape comes from Philippians 4, verses 6 to 8. And uh, this is Paul's most joyful letter. Think about the fact that it's the most joyful letter, even though he's written while he was under house arrest in Rome. He had a concern about the churches that he had planted. He had challenges all around him. He was wondering if he was going to survive. But it's his most joyful letter, most people would say. And as he is in this final chapter of this letter, he talks about how people should approach anxiety. And he tells people what they should do first when they're anxious. Now, what do you do first when problems and the troubles of this world press in on you? Maybe you reach for your favorite snack. Maybe you go shopping. Maybe you have a pity party. Did you ever notice that pity parties don't help at all? They don't make you feel better, and they certainly don't make anybody around you feel better. So what does Paul say? Well, you know the verses in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, be anxious for nothing. To note that the word translated anxious here is a word that's also used in the New Testament to describe a just serious concern. In Philippians, Paul is talking about things in this text that overwhelm us, that make us overwrought, if you will. But elsewhere in the epistle, for example, in chapter 2, verse 20, he describes his genuine concern for the churches. But we're talking a kind, that a kind of worry that keeps you up at night, a kind of anxiety that will not go away the kind of anxiety that can take over the way your mind thinks. That's why I call it mindscape. And I like to think about worry as their weeds, worry weeds. In the United States, we have a vegetation called kudzu. And if you go to the southern part of the United States, you'll see that as you drive along the interstate highway, you look at the trees, they're completely covered with this vegetation. And the vegetation is suffering, uh, suffocating all the trees 
underneath. And so worry is a weed that can suffocate the good things in our lives. But he goes on to say, he says, be anxious for nothing. Now, whenever I hear people speak in such absolute terms, it makes me suspicious. When a counseling, a couple comes into my office for counseling, and the husband says to, about his wife, she always, or the husband says uh, about her, she never, I'm always suspicious. There I said it. <laughs> because rightly so. Paul, here, there's no doubt about what he's saying. He says, be anxious for nothing. Uh, as, we, as we walk to school from Ian's house, uh, there's a sidewalk, and there's a little sidewalk graffiti that someone penciled into the wet concrete, and it says, don't worry, be happy. Is that what we're talking about here? Are we talking about Alfred E. Newman, what, me, worry? No, Paul is giving us something to do. And so the very first thing to do when worries come along, he says, is to pray. And everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And sometimes we forget to do that, don't we? Prayer is like a reset button. One of the things that I've come to appreciate is the the distance between my knowledge of technology and my children's knowledge of technology. And the people in my class this week know the gap in my knowledge of technology. Uh, and one, thing, one time something was going wrong uh, with one of my devices, and I called my son-in-law because he's very tech savvy. And he said, okay, Dad, here's what you do. Just unplug it and plug it back in. <laughs> I said, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just unplug it and plug it back in. And it worked. <laughs> it just reset everything. Well, we need to plug ourselves into, into God and remember that He is the one who's overseeing us and caring for us. And when we pray, we make our requests known to Him. In that verse, there are several words for prayer. One is a, a general word for prayer. Another word is the word supplication, which talks about specific requests. So we shouldn't fail to come to him when we have these kinds of concerns. And the result is that God gives us a peace that's absolutely remarkable. In my previous church, I had a family in which there was a tragedy. The 14-year-old daughter was with some friends two days before Christmas, and she just fell down. She dropped down. And it turns out she had a congenital heart defect called long QT syndrome, and she died. It was very sad, tragic, especially, especially that time of the year. I mean, it's bad enough any time of the year. But one of the things that, that struck the, fam the, the friends of the family was how much peace they had through this. It was a peace that Paul describes here as a peace that's beyond human comprehension. Because these people knew that they were in the hands of the Lord and that their dear daughter was in the hand of the Lord. John MacArthur describes that peace this way. True spiritual peace is completely different from the superficial, ephemeral, fragile human peace. It's the deep, settled confidence that all is well between the soul and God. Because of his loving, sovereign control of one's life, both in time and eternity. That calm assurance is based on the knowledge that sins are forgiven, blessing is present, Good is abundant, even in trouble, and heaven is ahead. The peace that God gives his beloved children as their possession and privilege has nothing to do with the circumstances of life. So Paul says, he reminds us, that the very first thing that we need to do is, is pray. But I think verse 8, I think there's a good reason that verse 8 follows verse 7. My contention is, and my experience is, that I don't pray all the time, I can't pray all the time, and so I believe in verse 8, Paul is telling us what to think about instead of worrying. He's saying, be anxious about nothing, he says, pray, but then he says, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about these things. And that's where I, uh, I walk through those particular uh, elements of the new mindscape, new vistas 
of our mindscape. The vistas that are going to be weed killers. And many people use the word whatever, whatever. When someone says whatever to you, you know they're really interested in what you just said, right? In fact, a Marist poll showed that the use of whatever has been anointed as the most annoying expression in, in conversation. So catch yourself when you, when you say that. And so what I'd like to do with you in the time we have remaining is walk through some of those vistas and see how they can address the worry weeds in your life. Talks about whatever is true. Whatever is true. Isn't that the place to start, though, really? And that raises the question, though, what is truth? Well, if you look at the dictionary definition, being in accordance with the actual state or condition of things, conformity to reality or fact. But here's the big question. How do you decide what is true? How do you determine what is true? How did you come to your convictions about what is true. Certainly it's a matter of your upbringing, peers, education, but that's a major issue in our culture and in your culture, I believe, the rise of relativism. George Barna, in two national surveys, noted that one among adults, and he did a survey among adults and one among teenagers, and asked if they believe that there are moral absolutes that are unchanging or that moral truth is relative to the circumstances. By a three to one margin, adults said truth is always relative to the person and their situation. And 83% of the teenagers said moral truth depends only on the circumstances. Only 6% said moral truth is absolute. So how do you decide? How do you decide what's true? Well, four out of 10 teens and three out of 10 adults described that they themselves were the primary consideration. And that's what has led us to the, it might be true for you, but it's not true for me, kind of situation we find ourselves in today. David Wells has written, truth is now simply a matter of etiquette. It has no authority, no sense of rightness, because it no longer anchored, is anchored in anything absolute. If it persuades, it does so only because our experience has given it its persuasive power. But tomorrow, our experience might be different. This led to... Uh, the word of the year in the United States for several years, which was coined by that great theologian, Stephen Colbert. Truthiness. Truthiness. Have you heard of truthiness? Well, what is truthiness? Here's truthiness. Truthiness is the quality of stating concepts or facts one wishes or believes to be true rather than concepts or facts known to be true. And it's perfect for our relativistic world. But the Apostle Paul had no doubt at all where the source of truth could be found. That the Lord God is the source of truth. The word of the Lord proves true, Psalm 18 says. He's a shield for all those who take refuge in him. The sum of your word is truth, Psalm 119 says. And the written word of God is an absolute standard that we can rely on to find out the answer, what is true. It reflects the reality of life, as James says, like a mirror that shows the way we really are. It's the power of transformation, the writer of Hebrews says. It gives us everything that we need for life and godliness. And if you want to see what that looks like, then we have the incarnate word of truth. The Lord Jesus Christ, who himself said that he is the way and the truth and the life. And little did Pilate know when he asked the question, what is truth, that the very embodiment and incarnation of truth was standing right before him. And the scope of truth is exhaustive. We learn the truth about God. So our views are no longer shaped by the current cultural wind that one day says he's an impersonal force of Star Wars, and another day like Morgan Freeman or Jim Carrey, heaven forbid. I find it interesting that the advertising for the film uh, Bruce Almighty uh, is from the directors of the movie Liar Liar. 
The scope of truth includes the truth about yourself. You know now that you are not merely an accident of history or a biological organism created as a result of a series of chance circumstances, one of which was the meeting of your father and mother. No, you've been made in the image of God with a purpose. You also learn the truth about other people. They're not merely things to be used, not merely people to be climbed over to accomplish our own goals. But they also are made in the image of God and the truth about the world. As we look into God's Word, we see it's not the best of all possible worlds, which is going to measure your sense of expectation, is it not? We understand that we're living in, living in a fallen world, but one day that world is going to be transformed. But how does, how does truth, how is whatever is true, how is that an antidote to worry? Let's think about that for a few moments. What about if you're worried about being too weak, if you're weak and insecure? You don't know you're going to make it. Well, think about the truth that God is all-powerful. He's going to give you the strength that you need. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And just a few verses later in this very chapter, Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And what was the Lord's answer to Paul when he was wrestling with his own weakness? The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. When I am weak, then I am strong. There's no need to worry when you're weak, because the Lord has promised that He, through His strength, will shine through you. Okay, one of the greatest worries that people have. Australians too, as we just saw. When you're worried if you're going to have enough. That's what people worry about the most money. But the truth is the Lord created everything and that everything belongs to him. He's promised to provide for your needs. Every one of God's sheep can exclaim with confidence, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we all, we all concern about things. I, I remember when I was a young minister, will I ever be able to afford a house? Will I ever a, be able to afford to send my kids to college? The Lord provided. And now, of course, we're worried about, will the Lord provide enough for us to retire? Why should we worry? Because he's promised that he will provide. Again, in this very chapter, Paul says that my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Are you, are you worried that he will sufficiently supply? You heard in Ian's wonderful prayer, that Jesus echoes these words, or actually Paul's echoing Jesus when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount told people, do not worry about what you will wear or what you will eat. The Lord is going to provide for your needs. Do you understand that in Christ, we belong to him? And he's promised if he gave his son for you, how will he not together with him freely give you all things? So the truth enters in to, to vanquish the worry weed of concern about money. When you're lonely, the truth is that God is everywhere. You're never alone. But perhaps you've lost your spouse of many years and suddenly find yourself alone. Maybe you're a single parent who, after the children are asleep, feel isolated and on your own. But remember, Psalm 139 makes it very clear that wherever you are, he is with you. It says, where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold on. It says, I will never... Never leave you 
nor forsake you. You're never alone. And plus, he has provided, you know and trust the Lord, provided a community of believers around you to help and support you. And for us, the truth of God's omnipresence was of special help when our son was in Iraq. He, he was there, he was a scout platoon commander at the height of the surge. And the reason it was called the surge was because uh, before the surge, they only had enough soldiers to knock Al-Qaeda out of uh, certain areas and then retreat to the forwarding, forward operating bases. But the surge sent enough soldiers so that when they would knock Al-Qaeda out of a community, that they would have enough soldiers to set up combat outposts in the communities, which helped rally the people to support uh, the effort to defeat Al-Qaeda. Let me tell you what. If you've ever had a child in the service in a combat zone, it's, it's an experience that I really do not want to, ex to have again. Because every moment of every day, you're wondering, where is he? What's he doing? Is he safe? One night we were sitting at home and the phone rang. The phone rang and it was Nate. Nate, where are you? He says, well, I'm, I'm out in the, they, they call it uh, Indian country over there. He said, we're in the middle of Indian country out here and uh, I was able to get hold of a, a satellite phone and so I'm, I'm giving you a call just to see how you're doing. He said, great, just talked a minute or two. Then we heard machine gun fire and a helicopter, and he said, whoops, I got to go. It wasn't a very comforting phone call after all. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what a, what a blessing. What a blessing for us to know that God was there too, and that God was with Nate. And by God's grace, Nate came home. Some of his soldiers, some of the men in his platoon were injured, none were killed, but God was with him. Whatever is true is very important. What's the source of truth? When the worry weeds come, claim the promises of God that he has given that address the situations that you face. Paul then says, whatever is noble, whatever is noble. It's a word that was common in Greek literature of its day, but not used very often in the New Testament. One writer said that it has such a richness about it that it's impossible to equate with any one English word, which is one of the reasons why you look at translation to translation, you see different, uh, different words used in the English language. As one translation source noted, it's difficult to find a good word for the adjective rendered noble. This fact is reflected in the diverse translations, honest, honorable, worthy, deserving, respect. Another possibility is dignified, since this adjective is often used in that sense. It can be expressed in a phrase such as that which causes people to look up or that which causes people's eyes to admire. Uh, Reniker and Rogers in their linguistic key to the Greek New Testament say that it implies that which is majestic and awe-inspiring. And so it coincides with how it was often used in the literature of the day. It was often used to describe gods and deities who were lofty and lifted up. I believe this applies as we look at our God as the one who is living in majestic reign. And all of this points to God's sovereignty. Sovereignty. When worries come along, remember that God is sovereign. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Deuteronomy 4.39, Know therefore today and take it to your heart, the Lord, he is God in heaven above, and on the earth below, there is no other. To be able to live your life in such a way, and I, I've come up, by the way, when I, when I teach my new members at our church, who are really not that familiar with Reformed theology, and in the membership class, I describe to them, I give, I give them a, a summary of Reformed theology that I think they can remember, because I remind myself of it every day. And that summary is this, God is God, and I'm not. God is God, and I'm not. But what does that do when you're, when you're facing difficulties, when you're facing um, circumstances you don't understand, recognizing that he is in some way working out his mysterious purpose 
And he promises in Romans chapter 8 that he causes all things to work together for good. It's an anchor for our souls, understanding that he is sovereign in those times of trouble. A couple of years ago, we were traveling and we came to a, a huge maze that was made out of boxwood bushes. And um, one of the things you'll notice if you uh, go through these mazes is that there's usually a platform overlooking the maze. And what is the purpose of the platform? Well, the purpose of the platform is there's somebody there in case people get lost and panic inside the maze. Well, we have to understand and know that, that God is, is watching over us, uh, directing our steps every day, even when circumstances come that might require or cause us to worry. A friend of mine went, when he graduated from seminary, became a pastor of a large church, uh, and shortly after he was there, the wife of one of his friends uh, asked him if he would be willing to go together and secretly buy a hot air balloon ride for her husband for his birthday. And my friend talked to his wife, and they decided they couldn't afford it, so they didn't do it. But she found some other friends who were able to do it, and the day arrived, and they got in the hot air balloon, and uh, they traveled over the land of Fort Lauderdale, and the hot air balloon struck high tension wires. And when the balloon caught fire, of course, the air heated, and it shot up into the air, and all of them jumped out to their deaths. They jumped out, station wagons with their children watching. They saw it with their very eyes. And my friend went to visit the widow of his friend who died. And here's what she said. He said, how are you doing? He said, if I did not believe in the sovereignty of God, I would be crazy. I'd be going crazy. Because on a horizontal level, I planned my husband's death. I made the appointment. I arranged it. But because I believe in the sovereignty of God, I know that in some way God is working out his purpose. And indeed, he did. Because many people came to Christ as a result of that. So remembering to uh, lean on the vista of God's sovereignty. So I think you see, and I obviously can't spend as much time on, on each of these as, as I did on those first two. But I think it shows us that having a right theological perspective, understanding where to find truth, that God is sovereign and he is working out his purpose, these are the things that help us in times of worry. Maybe right now you are wondering what's happening, but you can be sure that God is working out his plan in your life. So if that's the theological basis, then the next two really talk about the ethics in the service of the worry-free mindscape. Whatever is right, whatever is pure. I think you'll understand that whatever is right is closely related to whatever is true, because where we find what is right is, what is, is where what is true, and that is in the Word of God. And a lot of the time in life, people find stress, and they don't know which way to go, which way to turn. And scriptures are clear, though, one of the blessings we have is we have the Word of God, which gives us direction in life. Living in this relativistic age that we live in, I was telling my class this week we were talking about that, and uh, talking about advertising slogans that reinforce the uh, importance of me in everything. And we talked about the advertising slogan that uh, Neiman Marcus had a few years ago. Uh, Neiman Marcus. Are there any Neiman Marcus stores in Australia? No? Okay, it's a good thing. Every once in a while, there's a Neiman Marcus store near our house in a mall, and every once in a while, I walk through the Neiman Marcus store just to see what a $300 necktie looks like. And, uh, but their advertising slogan was, no rules here. Let's try that out. So you go in there, and you just I pick up one of those $300 neckties and move toward the door. <laughs> and the 
guard, excuse me, sir, did you pay for that? I said, no. He said, why not? The answer, no rules here. People don't understand what, what they're saying, and I think it's one of the reasons that some people are all stressed out because they don't know what's right. But we're blessed to, to have that direction in God's Scripture, in God's Word, to help us. And we also have the assurance that when we fail, we have a Savior who is perfectly righteous, who has given us His Spirit. As we yield to the Spirit, we will grow an understanding of walking in the way of truthfulness and holiness. Paul goes on to talk about whatever is pure. A purity isn't something you hear a lot about these days, my friends. And when you use the word pure in the United States, what people think of most often is ivory soap, which was touted as being 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. Richard Trench notes that it signifies purity in the highest sense, close to the idea of holiness. Gordon Fee observes, thus whatever things are pure has to do with whatever is not besmirched or tainted in some way by evil. When Jesus spoke about being pure in heart, he meant that Jesus, that God expects wholehearted devotion toward him and others. That's the idea behind this purity, the wholehearted love. So the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. One commentator wrote that to be pure in heart is to be single-minded, free from the tyranny of a divided self, which does not try to serve God and the world at the same time. That's the problem, the tyranny of the divided self. There are all kinds of troublesome weeds in this category. Hypocrisy, duplicity, two-facedness, and inconsistency, just to name a few. One of the clear helps in times of worry is making sure that our devotion is wholehearted, that our commitment is true through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of my favorite family shows that we actually are allowed or able to watch um, is America's Funniest Home Videos. You have such a show here in Australia. Isn't it great? It's really great. And you know one of my favorites? Almost every episode they have one of these where you got, you got the person who's trying to get into the boat, right? And I'm, where I'm going with this, you got one foot on the dock and one foot in the boat, and they wind up neither on the dock nor in the boat. <laughs> they wind up in the water. And this is the problem when we try to live duplicitous lives. We're not going to wind up with the peace of God. We're not going to wind up with what we think the world offers, but we wind up in the water. One of the new vistas of the new mindscape is wholehearted devotion to the Lord. That's going to help us. That's going to encourage us. That's going to give us peace too. But then this moves into the area of aesthetics. I'll hasten on. Whatever is lovely, whatever is lovely, think about whatever is lovely. The word Paul uses here is used nowhere else in the New, in the new Testament. It's used in Greek literature, is closely related to the word admirable that follows, Paul's list. The compound word made up of the word for love, with a prefix meaning toward. Therefore, that which attracts love is pleasing or lovely. Uh, the Greek philosophers could not separate the beautiful from the good, the true, and the real. They saw as unified in the one. While Plato spoke of this, he couldn't put a name on the one, but the Bible does the one who is the author of all these things and in whom they find their perfection, the true and living God. And let me tell you what, we had such a great night last night. The Smiths took us on, the Sydney Harbor Tour, uh, on the boat. So we had, we had lovely things all around us. We had the lovely view. What an amazingly beautiful city. We had lovely food. We had lovely music, didn't we? Lovely music. And we had lovely wives to look at, too, you know? This is important for us. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was a student of the beauty of the Lord, and he wrote, The beauty of trees, plants, and flowers, which God has bespangled the face of the earth, is delightful. 
The beautiful frame of the body of man, especially in its perfection, is astonishing. The beauty of the moon and stars is wonderful. The beauty of the highest heavens is transcendent. The excellency of angels and the saints in light is very glorious, but it is all deformity and darkness in comparison of the brighter glories and beauties of the creator of all. And so uh, the greatest beauty, of course, is found in the glory of God, but then we see it represented in his creation. Unfortunately, we live in a world in which the grand entrance of ugly arrived with sin. Sin impacted the beauty of God's creation, including humanity. The image of God in man has been marred, and man as created in the image of God was designed to be creative too. But sadly, that creativity has been used to create things that aren't really that beautiful. Have you noticed? Have you noticed some things that are called art that aren't very beautiful at all? For example, Jackson Pollock reflected meaninglessness and despair in going about his art by placing canvases on the floor and dripping paint on them from cans swinging above them. This was intended to communicate that chance rules. But even then, he couldn't escape the order of God's universe, could he? Because the laws of gravity and motion dictated the movement of the paint. Now, I'm a musician. I admit it, I play the tuba. People wonder about being a tuba player and a preacher. Well, it takes a lot of hot air to do both. In music, there's John Cage. Though he died in 1992, his music lives on. His composition, Organ 2, A-S-L-S-P, is being performed right now in Haberstadt, Germany, and will not finish until the year 2640, a totally lapsed time of 639 years. It began on September 5th, 2001, but the first year and one half, there was total silence. So you start the piece with a big rest. I'm not sure how you write a year and a half rest. Though as a tuba player, I saw a lot of rests in music. The first chord was not sounded until February 5, 2003. It did not progress to the second chord until January 5, 2005. Small bags of sand hold down the keys for their lengthy performance. The first movement will last 71 years. If you didn't figure it out, ASLSP stands for as slow as possible. So this begs the question, is this really music? Is this really art? Francis Schaeffer, who was a student of culture and the arts, said the more it tends to be only an intellectual statement rather than a work of art, the more it becomes anti-art. The bigger problem is that the statement is also often anti-God and anti-order and anti-beauty. Beauty, he writes, used to be one of the artist's highest priorities. Now, for many artists, it's among the lowest priorities, if it is even a criterion for artwork at all. And thinking about whatever's lovely as the antidote to worry, of course, you should fill your minds with things that are aesthetically beautiful, such as beautiful art, music, or the wonders of nature. But even as you do this, remember to allow them to point you to the creator of the natural world and the giver of human creativity that produces such works that are pleasing to the eye, ear, and heart. So yes, when you're stressed, listen to music, go to a museum, take a walk in the woods, but use them to enable you to reflect on the giver of that creativity. But also be sure to use the creative gifts that God has given to you. David Kim, who's the concert master of the Philadelphia Orchestra, has expressed this principle quite well. Here's what he wrote. Despite success and prominence as a musician, I was long blinded to my one true audience. I suppose I could even say that all playing was in vain. But with truth came purpose, and today I play to honor him who blessed me with his gifts. What a way to address the worry weeds. Use the gifts that God has given you to bring him glory. And I'll hasten on to the close. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, given up, give up the whatever Paul's writes, excuse me, whatever Paul is writing here is 
referencing something that his readers would have been very familiar with. The word translated excellent is a Greek word for virtue. It was the most comprehensive Greek term for moral excellence and the central theme of Greek ethics. The Greek philosophers themselves couldn't agree on what it meant. Plato argued that it was a single thing, but others spoke of a plurality of virtues. Most, however, believed that the purpose of practicing virtue was to become happy. We've already seen how nerve-wracking and frustrating the practice of virtue can be when it's left up to us. Maybe that's the reason we aren't happy but stressed. Paul's intention, however, was not to send his readers running back to Plato. What he intends, of course, is if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, is that that virtue be filled with Christian content and empowered by the Spirit of Christ. Benjamin Franklin, on one occasion, went to hear a preacher. He was preaching on this very text. And he was expecting to, to hear an encouragement, encouraging sermon about Christian virtue. But the preacher decided to use it as a, a pretense to say how people should appreciate their pastor and give more money to the church. Benjamin Franklin was very frustrated. So he decided to go home and he made a list of virtues that he hoped to see grow in his own heart and life. And he, the list was 12. And he discovered that as he tried to work on these virtues, he would get a good handle on one, but then as he moved to the next one, he would start forgetting what was happening in the first one. If you, if you know uh, Franklin's autobiography, you know that his finalists had 13 virtues because he had a Quaker friend who looked at his list, came up to him and said, Mr. Franklin, I think you're missing one important virtue you need to work on. And Mr. Franklin said, what is that? He said, humility. <laughs> <laughs> so he tried that one, but basically it was all futility. It failed. That was his undoing. He knew that he couldn't do it. And we cannot certainly do it ourselves either. We need the power of the gospel. And ultimately, it is Christ at work in us, the great peace giver who helps us address the worry weeds of our lives. But tonight, as we look at Paul's words, we ask ourselves, are you, are you centering your life on what is true? Are you allowing the Lord to renew your mind are you trusting in his sovereign purpose when you're tempted to worry? Are you looking to him for direction when you wonder what is right? Are you looking to him to remove the fear and the anxiety? Because he's promised he's going to give you everything, everything that you need. One last anecdote about our son uh, being a, in combat in Iraq he found himself uh, in circumstances where he needed certain equipment. He wanted a tow missile that could be attached to one of his Humvees. They were doing urban, urban clearing, and he wanted a sniper rifle. So he asked his commanding officer if uh, he could get that equipment. It would make their mission go better. And his commanding officer said, no, I do not have that equipment. And it was perplexing to Nate, but he had to go on and, and carry out his mission without those things. And I asked him, I said, Nate, why do you think your commanding officer didn't give you those things you asked for? And he said, my commanding officer was never in combat. He didn't know what it was like. You know, my friends, when you're tempted to be overcome with worry, remember that your commanding officer has been in combat. He's been there. He's been tempted in all ways as we are, and yet without, without sin. He certainly been, was in a situation where it could have been the temptation to be fretful, but found strength in his father. Paul encourages us to put these vistas in the forefront of our mindscape. Someone once wrote, worry gives a small thing a big shadow. 
put the glory of God and the promises of God and Christ in the foreground. And may the Lord enable you to see those worries feed. As Peter wrote, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting all your anxieties on him. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we've had tonight to, to think about worry. Uh, we admit that we are all warriors at some level in some ways. And we pray that you would help us to, to remember that you have given us resources to help us. You have given us, first of all, the resource of prayer. Help us to remember, Lord, that you promised to give us your peace when we bring our concerns before you. And thank you, Lord, that you've given us things to, to think about, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Lord, may we heed your word to think on these things. Thank you in Jesus' name. Please join me in thanking Dr. Whitmer for the... As I said before, we're going to have a time of Q&A now. And if you've got a question that's arisen uh, from tonight's talk, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. We've got people coming around with uh, roving microphones. Uh, please don't touch the microphone except to hold it. And uh, uh, please wait for the microphone to come. Okay, there's one down here, just down the front from uh, Rachel. Hello. Hi. Thanks for your talk. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is more of a conflict resolution kind of question, but it's related to opinions about what is lovely or and excellent and praise. I, it, it feels difficult to me that Paul urges this, these particular qualities when there seems to be a lot of difference of opinion on what meets those qualities. So, for example... That my, my example, my husband has had classical music training, and I haven't had any. And so sometimes I'll, I'll have something on playing music, and he'll say that's not good music. <laughs> but but it's great. I love it. I think it's worthy of praise. Who's right? And, <laughs> um, and am, oh, you're not going to get me on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're who made you judge between yeah. us. Um, but yeah, is is there some It's to some extent, which is it's mainly moral. Like, if there's something that's not sinning, we can say different court levels of things can be worthy of praise. How do we resolve this disagreement? Do you have any thoughts? Well, I think I think in some of the categories, it's it's pretty easy to distinguish. But in areas of aesthetics, it becomes more difficult, for sure. And a lot of a lot of that is formed by um, our own backgrounds. Our own, our own judgments, but um, uh, there's, I think, and I think it's true that majority of people, if you consider the examples I cited tonight, uh, most people in all honesty would not say that they are beautiful. So I think there is some, some range, and some range for disagreement. It's nothing to fight about. Thank you. Yes, just. Yeah. Um, there are two different words that are used, and one is just a general word for, for prayer in the Greek language. And the other one is more specifically pointed to specific uh, requests that we might make before the Lord. And so I think what Paul is trying to communicate to us is that prayers of, of all kinds and all ways and all places, but you know, there are some people who think that 
I, I've actually heard some people say to me that it's not right to pray for myself. And yet you look at the Lord's Prayer and what are the, the, the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. I think Paul is communicating to, in, to us in many ways that we should be bringing these requests to him. I think that's the point. Rob? Uh, how much uh, do we, how, how far do we take these absolutes? Uh, and I'm thinking about your reference to the Sermon on the Mount as well, and that sense of uh, there's just, I guess, if, from experience or fear, we, we, we see that there are Christians who did end up, you know, not having anything at the end and sort of, uh, so how, how far do we take those absolutes? Is there a sense in which uh, the, these promises are for the world to come and how much of it is uh, for the reality here and now in, in this age? That's a great question. And I, I think certainly that people have different opinions on what the needs are. But um, in the Old Testament, it says that he's never seen his people begging bread. But the confidence in, that we have is that we can be sure that he's going to provide for our needs. And I, I believe that it's put in absolute terminology so that we will believe that. So Paul doesn't say, um, my God will supply some of your needs or most of your needs, but he says, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And granted, there will all be, always be deficit until we meet him in glory one day, but uh, aren't those, those are great promises to, to cling to, though sometimes the answers may be a little different than we think. Hello? Uh, um, I suppose the question I've got is if we should be concerned about those who don't know Christ, for example, um, how does that, concern, and there's other things that we should have right concern for, I believe, mm -hmm. um, how does that play compared to worry? So yeah. uh, you could say, you know, I'm worried for my, for my mother-in-law who doesn't know Christ. Uh, is that the right way to think? Well, how do you, you understand the question? I do, I do. <laughs> I think, I think the, as I mentioned earlier on, that the word, the translated worry, is also used in Philippians to describe Paul's concern for the churches that he had planted. And I believe, I believe the answer is that when, when a worry becomes a, a, a dominant thought that keeps us awake at night, something that we cannot entrust to the Lord. And I'll give you, I'll certainly grant you that sometimes it's a fine line, isn't it, between concern, concern and worry. But okay, concerning the We've had the situation of praying for many people, many family members who have not yet come to Christ. And wow, where's the antidote to that worry weed? Well, the antidote to that worry weed for us has always been in the sovereignty of God. Again, understanding that God is going to work out his purpose and we pray and hope that that is going to mean the conversion of our loved one. But that's going to be his work in their hearts One right up the back. Hi. Um, sometimes our anxiety is uh, a bit more, sometimes it's about the situation we're in and sometimes it's a little bit more physiological. Um, we're affected by things that we might not be able to explain um, going on in our bodies. And um, I guess uh, on that topic, um, it kind of sounded like you were saying and I can see where you're coming from about when we feel weak, um, there are good things about that. And um, God is using that for his purposes. And you could almost make it sound like we need to almost embrace our weaknesses and, um, yeah, I guess pray that God will use our weakness for his glory. And at the same time, um, some of those physical weaknesses we face, we just, we really want to be rid of them yes. and um, so it's kind of I think that's a hard juggling act um, and how to pray in um, in face of weakness um, yeah if you can reflect on that I think that's a great question and I think you see that in the life of Paul don't you 
And you see that, that he was striving, he was asking for relief of his weakness, but he was told, at least in his circumstance, that through his weakness, God's strength would show through. And sometimes, sometimes we're going to be in a position to see our weaknesses gain strength, uh, but we, I think through the word, are told that we can be, we can find our rest and our strength in him when there is not relief for that uh, imminently coming. Stephen. Um, this might be more of a pastoral question, but uh, we have a phrase here. I don't know if it's made it into the States, but first world problems. Have you heard that before? What's that? First world problems, as in like we might complain about, first I don't know, problems. the world, the weather or something, and, or like, oh, the cutlery is dirty or something. And, Oh, like that's a first world problem. I'll translate. For no. <laughs> it hasn't, it hasn't so the made it over. Problem is a problem here. Trivial, mm. trivial things. Trivial things. I've just translated. Tri yeah. yeah. <laughs> From yeah. Greek to you know, so trivial worries. So like, um, I guess the question is more if um, a brother or a sister has consistently trivial worries that you might, um, yeah, you see they sort of constantly sort of. Uh, bringing these sort of problems and at some point whether you're praying with them through those kinds of requests and petitions can spill over from is there warrant for it to spill over from encouragement into look man just uh, <laughs> God is so you know, you know what I mean as if um, yeah yeah um, I think that I just think that grounding them in in God's truth is is the best thing to do to point them to find their security in him it's it's an a, it's a pastoral question that's true it's really i think a question of of discipleship um yeah it's so interesting my the church i served for 27 years was a church of first generation immigrants and it was fascinating to me now i'm i'm pastoring a church that is largely middle middle upper upper middle class and you're right the worries are different but uh, the, the fundamental answer is, is the same. In the church I'm serving now, the potential problem is one of complacency and self-sufficiency and uh, worrying about keeping up with the Joneses. So in the church that I served uh, among immigrant people, their worries were survival more survival. So you're right, they are, there are different kinds of categories for sure, but I believe that these, especially the first one, whatever is true, uh, can be tailored to, to meet the challenges that they all face. I think we'll wrap it up there. Just join me again to say thank you again to Dr. Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you.